Many thanks, Dr. Kereshi, for kind introduction. Um, I wish to stand on the system protocol of my Vice Chancellor and be represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic. Today we'll be looking at a very important topic, a soft skill that we all need to have as people of the world who are looking forward to changing the globe, agenda for career development. We tried, because I have a collaboration with the American Chemical Society, I'm a member too, um, University of Colorado and American Chemical Society, making this collaboration to bring you this lecture. So I'd like to give you a little bit about ACS. I talked to you a little bit about ACS, what it's all about, um, definition of key ways that we're going to be encountering today in this presentation. Then we try to look at the for research and then using network to improve our job search and keeping our jobs and then developing research footprints after we have worked them out. We need to leave footprints behind us. And then we see what makes us happy researchers irrespective of our core discipline. So a little bit about my background is always important as a speaker, as a presenter to talk about you so people can assess and make judgments of who you are and whether you fit to give the presentation. So there you can see my photograph when I was given UNESCO Real Award in 2013 in Paris. So I'm a faculty member in the University of Kodakot. I teach by chemistry. And I was a visiting faculty at the University of Nottingham, UK, and the University of Massachusetts, Amis, Massachusetts, United States. I've had postdoc experiences and one, all of them, I want to remind of, remind you of is the one that gave me this UNESCO Real Award where I was in the Institute of Agrophysics, Lublin, Poland. Recently, in 2015, I was made an affiliate of the African Academy of Science and I received the recent Commonwealth Fellowship in 2015. Now we have new people who've gone on board. I also received the UNESCO Real Award that I said earlier on in 2013. I have a PhD in biochemistry of this great university. I serve as reviewer to seven internationally acclaimed journals and I frequently speak on these topics here that are dear to my heart. Science communication, environmental management, health, safety and environment, diversity challenges in the laboratory, students and leadership and child protection issues. So this year, as like I said, is the American Chemical Society and has over 152,000 members, making the biggest scientific society in the world. It has one of six local section two technical divisions. I'm a member of Agri Division and Environment Division. So I belong to two divisions. So we have a lot of members 86% to be precise, having chemistry, biochemistry, chemical engineering, and related disciplines and other fields. So we also have members in business and industry, not only in academia. We have entrepreneurs in ACS, and members up to 25,000 are living outside the United States. So it's really a global organization. So it has its headquarters in Washington, D.C. Core values include passion for chemistry in the broader sense, focusing on members, professionalism, diversity, and inclusion. So as you can see, diverse in sex, in religion, in race, in ethics, in everything that ACL does, we are very diverse and inclusive. So we develop global code of ethics for Chemist, which I presented basically on in the first edition of this workshop last year, where we talked about the global ethics that chemists must follow to be able to deliver responsibly chemistry to the people. We also try to pull out chemistry practitioners and chemistry professionals, those who study chemistry and understand its rudiments, and then the practitioner, those who use chemical products in our day-to-day -day lives, in the kitchen everywhere, we are all practitioners. 
So we tried to apply that in the last presentation. So this started in 2014 to develop data specific to chemistry. We have a lot of codes scattered here and there, but a team came together, facilitated by ACS, to get code that applies to only chemistry professionals and practitioners. So in the vision, they have four major goals, ACS, to provide information that are authoritative in nature, comprehensive, and indispensable. So they do that through journals, through books, through magazines, insights, they have a lot of materials. Then advanced member careers, which is what I'm focusing today, member careers. And now because we create diversity and inclusion, so we go outside members, the career of people of the world. This is goal two that we're centering on today. And then improving education to foster the development of innovation, relevant and creative, effective chemistry education in the world and sharing the values of chemistry as it cuts across agricultural environment, health and all what have you, security even. So that makes us bring our member careers and the activity I want us to do today, although we're not coming up to do it here, if you have a paper you can write it down or you can create it in your brain. I want you to think about your career objective. Whether you're a professional, your mid-career, your early career. Early career will mean zero, no experience. You started, or you're a grad student, or you're in your zero to four years of practicing in your career, your early career. Then we have a mid-career, we've gone beyond four years, and we have a professional, so we've done 10 years plus. So wherever you belong, you think about your career objective. Oftentimes, you run your CV, and you write career objective. What do you write? Think about it. Because at some other point in this presentation, you come back to me so we we'll see what you were thinking about and what you will be thinking about. You tell us whether there are differences in what the, what it has been and what it's going to be. Research and career. What holds us together in our inclusion and diversity component of ACS is that we are all researchers. We're looking forward to add meaning to life, to bring new facts, or to further explain existing facts, principles, application processes. This is what we do with research. So that organizes and systematic investigation into study of materials and sources in order to establish facts or reach new conclusions is what we call research. And the person carrying out this investigation is the researcher. And then that occupation that you undertake for a significant period, you don't run into the bank, maybe you work for four months, you jump out, you go here, you say, oh, I have banking career, I have this, no, those are no career. You have to really do the job for a significant period of time. And then that job has the prospect for promotion, for increment, for progression, before you say that is a career. You're making out a career. So think about if you have a career or not, or you're thinking of getting into a career, the choice will be yours. So guiding us as researchers, I also like us to think on the industrial value chain because now the focus is on research and what touches the industry, how the industry can come into partnership with academia and how government can come in because they make the enabling laws, policies that drive delivery of the products of our research. So you may want to consider the industrial value chain that we have here. So you may consider doing R&D, the R&D, the research and development, where you create or understand a problem, you, you lift up a problem that needs solution. That's what you do here. For example, if as a biochemist, you go into a research that exposes the disease that may the disease condition that may develop or arise as a result of some habits or practice. So you have opened up a problem that needs solution. So in that case, you're focusing on R and D. So you should know where you're focusing in the industrial value chain. So your research can be properly channeled and focused in its nature. You can also go down to product and the product and development. There you make products 
from research, products that can be used. Okay, here a lot of industries do research that concerns product development. We also do a lot of them in the university, but we don't focus on product development because it's a lot of money, they're very expensive. So many people work on product development in. So your product may be application, they may be software, these are products that are already used, that can be used by people or ready to use by anybody or can be used by the generator. We can produce a software, for example, for examination, uh, processing, and we can use it. So you can produ produce a product for yourself. So we can also think about the manufacturing and supply chain, where we think about effective production, looking at all the nitty gritties, putting them in place, and then thinking about who needs who and who needs what. So putting all that complicated processes in place when we're thinking about research, those would be the manufacturing and the supply chain being targeted at. We can also think about the quality control and regulatory measures. So here we follow the processes that produces the processes that produce the products. So if you follow the process that is the product, so you'll be doing quality assurance. Then you follow the product itself, you get a sample of the products and analyze for conformity. Then we'll be looking at the quality control. So you may wish to target quality assurance or quality control, and that will be quality control and regulatory concerns. And then the sales and marketing, the advertising, the branding, the, the merchandising, all aspects of research that take this good to the consumer and how they can be well packaged. This will be the sales and marketing. And we have a support function that begins any stage of the industrial value chain throughout the support function. And this may be the IT, the managers for the university, the vice chancellor, they are support function. It's either they provide approval or they provide IT support or the ABPR will provide information and taking us to the world, telling people what we're doing. These are support functions that follow every aspect of research along the industrial value chain. Where are the jobs anyway by occupation? So a study that was released by the US Office of Personnel Management in 2016 gave the statistics we have here. So they have said, Administration and project management 286095. You see all them, biological and environmental sciences have been put in the middle, they have 69,647 positions, and we have the list art and design. And these that are the lead physical sciences, most time they go into entrepreneurship. So they are not creating a lot of jobs in these areas. So where you belong, you think about the vacancy, the position that exists in your area. So you think about the challenges that are peculiar to your area. So you consider when you are into any of this, that you have to trust the confidence you build in the job and make sure you have knowledge about what you're doing. We have left where we follow, I know him, I know her knowledge of the job will help us to deliver. Generals will always come, rumor, all those ego. I have got a lot. So I get very I get very egoistic. I don't listen to the instruction and then I get arrogant. And I syndrome, I I did, I did, I will do. We need to run away from them if we want to make a career as we work for career development. We must embrace knowledge, confidence success, smiling and loving. We have to enjoy the jobs that we do. And then the we syndrome needs to be right. We, we did together, we will achieve more. So what makes for a fruitful career? Building a network of peers and mentors. So you may wonder, what can my peers do for me? Some of you are sitting here today because your peers told you something is happening here today. So this way, the peers have helped you in your career path. So peers have, and you don't need to activate the peers or mentor network only when you need them because it's not going to work. You have to prepare, nurture them, 
water them before you need them for it to work. We'll look at them again in the following pages. So what you attend special training, special training, workshop like you're having, this is a soft skill, you may not have it in a curriculum in the university. So you attend specialized training, workshops, and find appropriate job vacancies. Where are they? These networks who we'll see how they help us to know where the jobs are. Then on next evaluation of your skill sets. Most times we are not honest. You run to the deputy license to academy, I need a job, I need a job as a lab scientist, you have no skill. And then he hires you and you bring in disgrace and shame. The mentors, your champions, they will be very, very pleased that you're doing well in the job that you're given to do. So whenever we're thinking about making a career, after we're going to look at the nitty gritty of career today, we should think about evaluating our skill set. Then we go to the application part because we have discussed about the job search. We have found where the job is. Application part is very important. When we make an application part, that important thing that we may have to put in that part, that important box is not a wishy washy box. You have the cover letter. The cover letter opens up what you want to do and what you bring into the table and some of your experiences you bring to the table and then how your life goals meet with the goals of your intended employer. And then you'll be adding your CV or the resume. The CV will be more detailed, usually more than two pages, depending. There are CVs that are over a hundred pages. Depending on what you've done in life, that's how the CV, CV is limitless. So your curriculum by tech will be on and on and on, depending on your experiences, skills, and knowledge. But your resume should not in any way be more than two pages. A page or two pages should be good for a resume. And most times when you're applying to the industry, you need a resume and not the CV, because industry people do not have time to look at every details. You make a bullet point that tells them exactly to what you're bringing to the industry. But university, research institutions are going to look for details. When you've attended workshop, you've attended training, you have developed product, you patented, you publish, you organize some meetings, you have some position responsibilities that will tell how you will function in that institution. All of these are in the application part. We do not forget the certificates to show evidence of the knowledge. I have knowledge in this in biochemistry, in chemistry, in accounting, in various, you have to prove it in engineering. You have to show with certificates and then you are good to go. You also have to look at a call to know some other important document that you ask to bring that specific to the organization that are using the call for vacancy. So that's very important. So you prepare for a feedback. Many people do not prepare for this feedback. It's a very important time where you receive a no or a yes. So when they come back no, they come with criticism. Please accept them. Look at them and fight on. Because it's only those who survive the fight that can fight for the next. So we don't throw our towels and say, oh, I've tried, I put up application three times, I never succeeded, so I'm not going to do it again. No, there are a lot of people looking. I showed up the distribution of job in the US in 2016. So you can see there are a lot of people also looking for what they're looking for. So you have to be patient, preparing for the feedback. But then, if it's a yes, that means they want to see you for an interview. So how do you ask the interview? to go and come at tops to impress your interviewers. So you have to prepare all of that and be you and then if you have evaluated yourself and you know that you are the person they're looking for, you'll be able to prove to them that you are the one. And then when you get the job, you think about collaboration with the right mind, 50-50. You give, I give. Collaboration is not about one person. I want to collaborate with you. So you can only tap, tap, tap and it becomes parasitism. Remember, the parasite does not enjoy because the host is not happy. So we should not do parasitism in any career. 50-50 responsibility is a shared one. Even if on a weighted average one is weightier, but everybody should meaningfully 
contribute to relationship. In the job market, there are four sectors that we're looking at. Higher education, industry, government, and entrepreneurship. So which one? When we evaluate some of the values and skills that we're looking at today, you know whether you're in the wrong place if you're already on a job or you're preparing to go into a job. You can be thinking straight where you need to go. So if you achieve your career goals, it makes you stand out from the crowd. And then if you're contemplating a new career path like a grad student or striking out on your own to set up your own establishment, you will be happy you did. So what are the values when you're thinking about values? Sometimes you go for interviews, even as university lecturers, they ask you, what are your values? Many people don't know their values. What are the values? You scratch the brain, you don't know the values. So it's important to look at some of the values that are very important because if you don't understand your values, you won't be able to appreciate what you're doing and also to know where you need to go and be happy because we all need to be happy. Outside feeding our families and creating opportunities for others, we also need to be happy from our careers. Advancement, is that one of the values that you're looking for? And employment that gives you opportunity for promotion and recognition when you have distinguished yourself. Is that a value that you have? Then you have to hold it fast and make your assessment for settling on a job. Goal orientation, are you committed and motivated by your personal objective that you don't want people to come into it? So this is an important value. Autonomy. Some persons have this value so dead to their heart. Autonomy. They don't want to be ordered around. Freedom. An ability to direct yourself. You may come to the academia. I think that's where we have a lot of autonomy. You just know that you have to make the university great, but you have high level of autonomy than in the industry. Value. Challenge. A lot of people like challenges that drive them to become better people. So what are those? Do you like challenge as a person? If you don't like challenge, so you know where to head to. What of security? Some persons like a job just because there is security, because they can determine, they can predict the job is stable, sleep and wake up, the job is there. And some person like to take risk. Get the most of it, even if it doesn't exist after five years, I'm in and about myself, I'll be able to pick another one. So what do you like? Balance. Having a balance between personal and business is important value for a lot of people, having a balance. Do they consider you when you're pregnant to give your maternity leave? When you're sick, do they insist that you will deliver on the target? When there are no values, no balance between your personal life and the profession you're practicing, then such persons may have a problem with such organizations. So think about your values. Discoveries. A lot of people just want to discover. They like to go to a new place. They like to jump from one job to the other. It gives them like, some kind of excitement and fulfillment when they go to a new place. Not necessarily that it's better than the former or that it's good after all. But they just like discovery. Is that the kind of value you have? Know thyself, man. Perfectionism. Some persons like doing things exactly right, no matter how long it takes. So organizations that don't do things that way, they may not fit in. So they just want to do it the way it should go, even if it takes us 100 years to achieve that goal. And then our tourism, selflessness. People who are selfless, self-giving, irrespective of the treatment given to them, they just want to be themselves and contribute. Opportunity to contribute to welfare of others. There are many other values, but I think these values are very important and key to deciding about your career. Whether you're on an existing career to maintain or you need to service your career. So I have a career that not mean you don't need career development, but we need to service the existing career. Or you want to get on a career, or you want to strike out and set up your own. See this when I go to give lecture to NYC, when you go to the camp, orientation camp to talk to NYC CV. You look at strengths. Give me some strength. They don't know what strengths are. Some will just say, um, I just want an organization that will give me opportunity. No organization wants people who 
want to take from them at the outset. When you're preparing your objective, your career objective, you should in no way write you're looking for organization that will give you a place. No. You should talk about what you're bringing to the table. You should showcase your experience, your skills, and knowledge. So your strengths, know your strengths. They are different from your values. Taking initiative is a strength. Working independently is a strength. The organization may want to come for you because you like to work independently. You don't need a lot of supervision. People telling you do here, do here. Somebody can go to bed because they know you take one assignment to the next level and paying attention to detail. You like to be a lecturer if you're paying attention to detail. Because we try to look at everything, especially scientists. They might need us. If you're supposed to measure 0 0.5 and you do 0 0.45, they're quite different. So paying attention to detail. Be flexible. Some persons are very flexible. When I was employed in Dangote, I was employed as quality control officer. But when I got there, the salt plant was supposed to start at the wharf in Port Harcourt here, MPA wharf, wasn't ready. So I was reposted to admin HR. So I became admin officer. So I functioned as admin officer for a long time before the plant was ready. So this is flexibility. Are you going to be happy or be moody all day because you are not flexible? Is that the strength? Communicating. The strength of communicating, sharing information, whether orally or putting it down, is a strength. No alone, nobody else knows. It doesn't matter whether they know, the team knows, I just know. So training is a strength if you like to train others. Counseling and advising. Some persons are concerned about others. So counsel them, advise them from my experience, from other people's experience. I like to tell you about this strength. Leading and providing direction to groups. Not everybody is a leader. Another day will be for leadership. We may discuss leadership, but then leading is a strength. Leading others to a direction. Trying to make them behave or think in some way is also a strength. Doing research. I pay attention to investigating to, re to raise new information or to add meaning or to further understand existing information that doing research is a strength. Analyzing problems and issues. So a person just like to bring up the problem, hey, this person is bad, this system is bad, and all that. They can analyze it and bring up, it is bad. From where? How did you get there? Some persons have the skills to analyze these problems and issues, and others are good at solutions. Okay, we've analyzed it. We have a clear picture of what the problem is like. What do we do? That solutions. Some persons are solution providers. And then bringing new ways, thinking out of the box, innovating. That's a skill, a strength. Managing finances and creating budgets. Some people don't like to deal with money. When they're in a group and there's a grant, they just want to give me money to do this. They don't care about documenting. I was given this and I returned this. I did this. Get me receipt. They don't want to handle that. So it's a strength if you can manage finances and create budget for any activity that you want to do. Managing processes, driving them, being patient, managing people also, people of different character, constitutions, people from different origins, diverse situations, maybe even ethnic origin or even people coming from different cultures. So you are good at managing them and not having disagreement all of the time. So that's also a strength. Planning and organizing projects is a very important one. So a lot of industries will be looking at you if you have the strength. But you don't go listing them all if you don't have them because the time will come for you to prove it. So if you have them, showcase it, pick it. Performing administrative work is also not easy. Administrators. So if we want to have meaningful work, we have personal strength on one side. If you look at the Venn diagram, you have the values on one side, the job market opportunities. Opportunities need to be there, one. Then the strengths you have identified is there. The values, they meet your values. And then you have the intersection. There is the sweet spot. 
So if there is an intersection between these three, you have a sweet spot. And believe you me, you will enjoy your career. And also, if you're thinking of making a meaningful career, you think about legacy, mastery, freedom, and alignment. Legacy, you may wonder, getting into a job and I'm thinking about legacy, what I leave, what I bequeath the organization with. How can I think about that before getting into it? But it's very important because it helps you to assess yourself. If actually you need to be in that thing, you need to think about what am I leaving them with if I get in there? What am I good at? You're using your skill sets, you're using your strengths and your values, and you're able to make a projection into the bigger picture, and you can think of legacy, what you leave them. It may be honesty. They won't forget you for being honest at all times, telling the truth, no matter whose horse is God. So mastery. You need to master yourself first before any other. So if you master yourself, you're sure of what you're capable of doing and what you're capable of not doing, then I think you're ready for the job. Then freedom is not the kind of freedom this lady said, he's asleep, so I am free. But this is true freedom. Freedom from being oppressed of any sort because you know what you're contributing and you read your job description. Do they fit in this fits well, but here there is a problem with alignment. If the goal of the organization does not fit with your own personal goals, then you have something like this. There won't be alignment. So it's important to consider that. So if you want to think about networking, because If you want to network, you meet someone you think you can network with, you have to have a purpose. Not just because I like you, you want to think of why. If you now know why, you go close to the person and have an effective handshake. A very effective word, firm handshake. The person knows that you also are aware of what you're about doing. So effective handshake. And then introduce yourself nicely. And you shouldn't take the stage when you're trying to establish a network. You should allow the person to have opportunity to say who she is or who he is. So just in a jiffy, you talk about yourself, what you do. I am this, I am an accountant, I have three working experience with the bank and I have done this and I've consulted for this and who well. I'm all the team that they did this, that and that and that. So in a nutshell, two, three important achievements in the area so you can trigger the attention in the person you want to network with. So you engage the person about him, about her, not about you. Try to make the discussion to be centered about the other person. He feels important, she feels important. Then there could be effective communication. And then you offer your business card if you have it. If you don't have it, you can take the phone number so you can call and follow up. If you follow up, I'm assuring you that it can be an effective network. So why network? A lot of people go into networking without purpose, without understanding why they need to be in that network. Very important. The network, as I came and told you, that this year is the biggest scientific organization in the world, and I'm a member and I also do a lot of things for ACS and they also do for me. There are a lot of organizations I belong to, of course, even national organizations. So they help you to build your profile so you can be more presentable in your field. So building a profile. Then there you can find coach, you can find mentor, you can find champions. So who are these coaches? You look at the coaches. Coaches are those people who bring you to what you never knew. A new field, they help you to broker a new field. And then, soft skill or technical skill. I want to learn this. Oh, I'm not good at statistical analysis of my data. And maybe, I see Babatunde here, Dr. Babatunde, so he takes you through SPSS. He's a coach, you don't have any long-term relationship. So you just meet him with a problem, and then he puts you through it, and relationship ends. He's a coach. So the mentor is a more enduring relationship. So the mentor will give you advice. You can see there are two ways. 
but then it's coming more from the mentor. So it gives you advice, it exposes to maybe travels with you. The other time, Professor Doka traveled with a student out of the country and she spent some money. So that is exposure, trying to make sure that the mentee is exposed. Because there's an agreement, when you discuss, you agree on what the mentee wants to learn and what the mentor wants to give you. So that should be the discussion. So you be focused. So it's what's in you, it's powering you. When you send your paper and you're it rejected, if you're an academia, if you're in the academic, okay, you get an inspiration. I had 100 rejections. I had that. I know Professor this person, I know this person, I know I can't find a job. Oh, this person couldn't find a job after a first class. They inspire you with such stories. So these are mentors. And then you see the <coughs> champion. The champion is always ahead of you. The mentor may not be ahead of you age-wise, position-wise, but because he has or she has what you're looking for. So that's why they're on the same, I put them there together. But the champion will be well ahead of you. Maybe the VC, maybe the DVC, and you are there. So they don't care about long term. It's not long term, but they have you in their minds. They have your phone number, they have your email address. There's a call for this, they send it to you. They don't care about how you follow up with the application. These are champions and they are very important in the career. So who are your champions? Have you got any? If you've not got any, I think you will rise from this workshop to think about your champions, your mentors, your coaches. You need this report. So we'll get them from networks. Meet headhunters. Headhunters are those who have a, like neighborhood headhunting, have best heads. So these are people who go to look for what they are looking for. You are already in a job. They come and harvest you into a position that you really fit in. So they have very professionals who are identified by what they are doing. So we call them headhunters. So you find them there and then they harvest you if you really need to move or to move up. So headhunters are there in the network. Consultants and recruiters, those who may hire you if you don't have a job or you wish to change your job, or then those you may need to hear from consultants to consult on with them on some important issues or some thematic area that you really need consultants and services or even professional work. Then learn more about job openings. If you belong to networks, most times they advertise